back to Jeff Kanaga Live. First time, seven months with live guests. What a way to start <laughs> with Professor PLO Lamar. First, first one, you're the first since March, okay. since COVID. <laughs> My goodness, is your head spinning like mine is? Uh. <laughs> but you know, it's a conversation we have to have, gentlemen, as painful as it is, because Kenya, you know this, Barack, we've been through this time and again. Kenya is bigger than any individual. It's bigger, let's face uh, uh, it. Absolutely, and uh, that's why I keep on saying that uh, letters are. Uh, uh, pay very close uh, attention to the institutions, and the institutions uh, are embedded uh, embedded uh, in the law. Let us uh, begin by looking at uh, the constitution, and let us look at uh, uh, other laws that are uh, then derived from the constitution. And yes, uh, I agree with uh, my friend here. He's a professor of law. I'm not. Uh, about the silences. But uh, you see part of the challenge, as uh, my friend Steve Ogola uh, keeps on saying, is that uh, many a time um, the lawyer is uh, a paid uh, up uh, professional and many times he articulates uh, the perspective and position of the paying agent rather than anything that we could call objective truth. And uh, maybe that is the way it uh, ought to be. I do not know when it touches on a matter so important as the constitution, the constitutional dispensation, whether we could uh, start uh, objectifying our subjectivity and find uh, that we are placing the country first. And therefore, regardless of uh, where we are, we advise ourselves in a manner that uh, places the country first. We have seen that uh, there have been situations of uh, what can only be described as a blatant impunity that uh, from time to time court orders have been given. Like what, like what, like what? Uh, there have been many court well, give me, orders. Give me an example. There, 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 there's, there's been something about the 41 judges unless you are uh, the visitor in our Jerusalem who doesn't know about that. You would know that uh, we are sitting and waiting for the president to appoint 41 judges. Mm -hmm. The process has gone through the court system. Nothing has happened. The Honorable Attorney General has uh, advised the president that I uh, ignore that. And when you use certain value-loaded, value-loaded idiom like ignore that, I think uh, we are gravitating into very dangerous space. There ought to be a more uh, sedate uh, idiom that uh, shows that there's a respect of institutions and those who occupy those uh, institutions instead of uh, telling the head of state to ignore that. And if I were President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, if my Attorney General wrote to me and told me, ignore that, disregard that, I would disregard it. <coughs> All right, hold that thought for a moment. Prof, Barack just said, you lawyers, you dance to the tune of your clients. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Yes. What about political advisors? Who are they dancing to the tune of? Let me be the very guarded in saying that. I think uh, that is a very pedestrian view, and it's not his view. It's the view that he has cited. It's a very pedestrian view <coughs> of, of looking at what lawyers do. In, in this particular context, not, it, not, it has been not, my view. Yeah, it has in, been your view. In this particular but I'll context. use the word pedestrian with due respect. Mm. My own view is that there are certain things. If, if I'm instructed by a client to act in a particular matter, this is a matter that is out there in the void. And I know it is in the nature of the law that people will interpret the Constitution differently. But what we are saying is that the law is 99% common sense. And we are asking ourselves, and I've said at the very outset, that if you want to be mechanistic about the law, if you want to look at the black letter law, then you would proceed after 21 days on the 12th day of October to dissolve parliament. And then when you dissolve parliament, and parliament must be understood in the Ken context of the Kenyan constitution to mean the National Assembly and the Senate. Mm -hmm. You will proceed to do that, then you will be left with a situation where you cannot operate. None of the institutions of government will operate except by dint of executive fiat. 
You don't want a situation such as that. Do we have precedent where an advisory has been given to the president or to the executive of a country and it has been rejected? Yes, indeed, Boris Johnson did give an advisory to the monarch of the British and it was the subject of a determination of the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court did find fault with it. And, and I don't want to go to that. I'm simply saying that there is a sense in which, allow me a little spirituality. Hmm. Sabbath is made for man, not man for Sabbath. So that when you are interpreting the law, you've got to look at the practical consequences of it. And my good friend used a very good analogy that this particular clause in the Constitution was scarecrow. It was assumed by the drafters of the Constitution that by dint of this provision, Parliament would in an orderly manner do what is good and right. Parliament has tried times without number. When we find ourselves in this kind of quagmire, what would I have anticipated even before the Honorable the Chief Justice Maraga gave this advisory? Hmm. I would myself, because we are not, this is not theory. There would have been a sit down of Chief Justice Maraga, the speakers of both houses, the Honorable the Attorney General, and the President of the Republic of Kenya, in order to determine we find ourselves in such a situation, what do we do? Mm -hmm. Because in truth, Parliament has not behaved as was contemplated by the Constitution. Mechanistically, Maraga would have said, I'm enjoined by the Constitution to advise you to dissolve Parliament. Mm -hmm. I do not want to do that because I'm alive to the practical realities and possibilities. Yeah. Your Excellency, what do we do? In other words, Barack, you're damned if you do. Yes. And you're and damned, you're damned if, you... if you don't. Yeah. Because uh, either way, you are in a quagmire. Mm. If Parliament carries on with business without uh, the President uh, giving us the way forward, it is uh, a Parliament that... Uh, is uh, acting extra legally because, as a uh, good professor says, in uh, a mechanical and uh, even pedantic uh, context, the Chief Justice has done what the law says should be done. All right, and therefore, yeah. I go back <coughs> to my second scarecrow. Why is it so difficult? In a context where the head of state has not been told how exactly and within what time he should dissolve parliament, he could give himself a futuristic date, perhaps in March next year, perhaps in June next year, in August next year, and tell the various institutions that by the stroke of midnight, parliament will stand dissolved. That will give them some latitude, as Professor uh, says, to do something about it. I do not know whether this is one of the issues that have prompted uh, His Excellency the President to call for three days of uh, prayer. Mm -hmm. Maybe out of those three days of prayer, we are going to uh, receive an epiphany which will then uh, give us the way forward. Wow, that's deep, that's deep, epiphany. October 12th deadline. Okay, let me ask you this, in all honesty, and you're advising the deputy president right now. Why is it so important for him to be president? I mean, anyone can be president. Why is it so important for him? I, I have advised him that it's not so important for him to be president. Mm. But I have advised him that uh, it is good for him to exercise his uh, democratic right and uh, freedom to hold uh, an opinion, to run for political office, as clearly stated in the constitution of uh, this uh, country. And uh, it is a view which has been held by many people in Jubilee, including those who are today uh, suddenly having a, a brainwave and saying that uh, he is not uh, a fit for that office. We saw them ban storming the space and uh, saying things like uh, my 10 years and Ruto's 10 years. In fact, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta started campaigning for the deputy president even before he got uh, his second term. It is not absolutely necessary that uh, 
William Ruto must uh, become president of uh, this country or any other individual must become president of this country. But they exercise and enjoy their democratic uh, freedom to participate. And uh, if someone else becomes a president, so be it. So okay, Pio, let me ask you this. Hustler dynasty. It seems to be working with that uh, Wanjiko down there. It's working with Wanjiko. Hustler, we've worked hard. This whole thing, as opposed to those people. Old money. Look what they've done. I, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> narrative. Yeah, just that before, he, before I get into that, Mwalimu <laughs> yes. Nyerere uh, used to say this. Ukiona mtu anataka sana kuwa rais, jitahadhari na mtu huyo. Biashara gani hiko katika ikulu. If you want somebody is too eager to be the president, <laughs> Throughout history, yeah. even God himself loved the reluctant leader. Moses was reluctant. Mm. Joshua was reluctant. Reluctant leaders make the best leaders. But people are entitled to them, their democratic right. But let me now go to the question <laughs> of Hustler. Okay. I'm very afraid for Kenya when we have this binary approach to the country. But yet, there is merit in what is being said, and I don't have to agree with <coughs> William Samuel Ruto, because the message that they are articulating and is being midwifed by my good friend Barack Muluka and I think Eliud Dowalo, <coughs> they are midwifing a very powerful message and is resonating with the public that there is a dichotomy by those who are daddy's boys. Daddy's boys to mean my father was a minister, my father was a president, my father was a vice president, my father was this, my father was a PC, my father was this, and therefore Kenya owes us. Unspoken. And there are those who feel that they have been downtrodden. In Kiswahili they say it very well, and allow me to use Kiswahili. Imegawanywa kwa mabwana na watwana. <laughs> Kuna wa mabwana na watwana. But it's dangerous. It is dangerous because it creates a fertile ground for conflict. It energizes the so-called hustlers in a manner that it has, is at once positive and negative so that they build an enemy. Who did it in history before them? Hitler in Germany used it. Benito Mussolini used it. Attila the Hun used it. What would I love to hear? That we have a Kenya where we are looking at things that affect us all. Health, education, agriculture, innovation, invention. This country regained our independence in 1963. This country is less than 60 years old before, since it regained our independence. When you want to divide it on that basis, in as much as there is merit, you are setting us up. We looked into the abyss in 2007. We stared. The world came and pulled us back. This time round, when you see what happened in Muranga, that is a cakewalk. Mm. If we go on that trajectory and sell this message, Jeff Koinange, Jeff Koinange, I'm not a Jewish prophet, but we are headed in the wrong direction. Mm. We must de-emphasize this and only talk about one Kenya. Where there is no Jew or Gentile, there is no Kikuyu or Kamba or Luo. There is no Hasla, there is no dynasty. Otherwise, Jeff Koinange. Jeff Koinange, I'm struggling yeah. to understand what my mm. good friend is saying. Which part are you struggling Which with? Which part are you struggling <clears throat> with? Uh, everything that uh, he has said. Uh, First, is it true that there are poor people in this country? Of course there are. There are. Is it true that uh, the distribution of wealth is uh, pyramidic? Yes, it is. 
Is it true that the conversation about poverty and its eradication has been part or framed as part of the national agenda? Yes, it has. At Independence, we were talking about uh, defeating poverty, ignorance, and disease. And my good brother speaks to those three things. He says that uh, we must have education, we must have health, we must eradicate uh, ignorance, we must have schools, which are good things. But it is true that some people have education, not just within the country, but offshore. That in fact, we have people who preside over education in this country, but whose progeny enjoys education overseas. That we have people in this country, and thanks to COVID-19, and I'm sorry, I know you suffered a little That's okay, thank you, that's all right. I'm sorry, I should have started. No, it's okay. But thanks to COVID-19, all the same, that uh, it levelized mm -hmm. us, and all of us were here for the first time. Mm. There are people who have been in charge of the Ministry of Health. When they fall sick, they go out of the country for treatment. That the only place where you find uh, the Walala Hoi and Walala Hai uh, together in this country uh, in the cold rooms. I think it is important that we have this conversation. Without but without we can have this conversation without the animals that seems to be informing it. We cannot say that the poor should remain poor mm. quietly, silently, because if we speak about their situation, <coughs> the country is going to erupt. There have been situations where those kinds of conversations uh, have been bottled and they have erupted because it's like trying to cover a fire with the palm of your hand. Let this conversation we be held. I agree. Let us I'll shift the matrix. Mm. Let us not demonize <coughs> political conversations about the true status of our existence here because poverty is real. Let us talk about it. We have heard people saying that the challenge in this country is about uh, the exercise of power at the very top, uh, and that uh, therefore, if we have uh, five uh, senior positions at the top, then uh, everything will be all right. Mm. That everything does <coughs> not assuage the pain and hunger in the ordinary person's uh, belly, we must address it. And I think that that conversation is a conversation that we can have. But when people start uh, going all over the place saying that let us not have that conversation, they are actually encouraging us to sit on a time bomb because whether you like it or not, the Paris mobs are one of these days going to get very, very disillusioned. They are going to feel like they have nothing to lose and they are going to storm the Bastille. As in July 14th, 1789, allow you know what me to say something. Mm. I agree with Barack completely. But as a student, you must have read of a person in the Nottingham Forest called Robin Hood. Mm -hmm. Stole from the rich, gave to the poor. We must not allow the politics of Robin Hoodism <coughs> to define how we are. And I'm one who is averse to the political process being used by individuals to distribute largesse. I think that what we should be selling to the people is ideas. Because when we allow Robin Hoodism to characterize and to define our politics, then we get it wrong. I would want to hear people go out there and tell young people, and this administration, this administration <coughs> told us that they would create a million jobs. This administration said that we would have laptops. This administration said many things. This administration will be judged on the things that they promise in their manifesto. And this administration is going to be found wanting because it fell short. So what I'm saying when I'm speaking about these things is that you can continue to talk that language of dealing with poverty without having a binary approach which then creates a society which is divided and without giving prominence to the politics of Robin Hoodism. Mm. But uh, the poverty, the hunger <coughs> is real. 
you can't tell a hungry person that you are not hungry because the hunger throbs in their stomach. And uh, like a certain uh, reggae musician said, what is there to smile about when you look at the face of the hungry child? What is there to smile about when you look at the state of the schools? What is there to smile about when you look at even the police stations? Let us agree that there is need for a, a conversation. If we have witnessed uh, Robin Hood, perhaps Robin Hood has robbed the rich to give the poor, but there are others who have given the poor nothing. So let us sit around the table. Let us accept that we can hold a conversation about the poverty, about the hunger, that we can avert the time bomb. Because mm. as I said before, and history is full of uh, lessons. If you think that keeping quiet about it is the solution, is the alternative, you bury your head in the sand. Yeah. History is littered with examples, like you say. Gentlemen, let's look at some yes. tweets. Do you mind? Yes, yes please. Because yeah? you guys, I mean, I could talk all evening, you know Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I could talk all night, but you guys have been fantastic. So we took take a look at some tweets. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tweets coming in so thick and fast. Paul David Davies says, PLO is right. Drums of political war are beating and they need to be stopped by whatever means, even if it is banning political events until two months before elections. We really don't care. Barack, you don't agree with that, huh? Don't, uh, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. Don't ban. I mean, just keep going. <clears throat> so many tweets. Wycliffe Gifted says, Internal wrangles within the Jubilee administration needs to be resolved in a matter or in a manner that Kenyans' lives and national development is not jeopardized. I still believe that reconciliation is the best way to go for our leaders. Well, you know, that marriage is already over, like you guys said, so um, <clears throat> I don't know. Maybe three days of national prayer would help. Modoniwa Mwagi says, thank you for the great conversation. I institutionalized de-ethnicization of Kenyans, job creation and enhancing cohesiveness are key to tangible nation building to build a strong and globally competitive nation. Wow. She's speaking like you people here, you know, heavy language. Gabriel Kanja. Ask Professor PLO, what do you think the best way to achieve two thirds agenda rule is? Is dissolving parliament the I think we did that already. Mm -hmm. Is there a guarantee that a new parliament will meet? Oh, yeah, yeah, we did that. Okay. <clears throat> uh, Wanja Douglas says, as painful as it is, this is a conversation we should have as a nation. We must face it that right from the top, we are failing Kenyans. Let our leaders tonight listen to these pots of wisdom and find our paths again, it is not lost. Gentlemen, thank you for that. Thank you for all your thank tweets. You. Let's conclude, gentlemen, because I know there's a curfew yeah. and you guys, a curfew. you know, yeah, I apologize. Yes, well, and I need a letter to uh, uh, allow me. <laughs> we, have, we have a letter. <laughs> Can you tell me? Uh, IG. I'm to, sorry, uh, are you heading uh, to Karen or where are you heading? Um, I'm just uh, okay. heading to the slum. <laughs> <laughs> Lama. I got you. No, we, I got you. We, we will accommodate him at Sagret. Gentlemen, some closing thoughts. Barak, let's start with you. Going forward. Uh, go, going forward, I think uh, this is our country, as uh, mm. we have uh, kept saying all along, and that uh, the country must uh, come fast, and that um, the rule of law is uh, very critical. If and when we gravitate away from the rule of law, then we are about to gravitate away from everything that uh, holds us together. Because if I don't obey the law and I get away with it, with impunity, you don't obey the law, you get away with it impun with impunity. Uh, he disobeys and uh, we deal with him, family and with a hammer, we encourage him uh, to uh, also disobey the law. So let the law apply equally. Let it be like the saw that cuts down and cuts up, and let it be the same for everybody. If we say, let there be no political campaigns at this time, let them cease for everybody. If we say, let people declare the sources of their wealth, and I think that is very important. William Ruto should tell us, should tell Kenyans where he has got his billions from. Raila Odinga must tell Kenyans where he has got his billions from. Mm -hmm. Francis Atwoli has sat here 
and uh, broken a phone that cost him, I, I'll not break mine, <laughs> it has cost him close to 300,000 Kenya shillings on this floor. We don't know where he has got his wealth. We don't know where his factories are. We don't know where his ranches are. We don't know where his farms are. Let all of these people tell us where they have got their billions from. It is another conversation that we must have as a, a country and decide how we shall go forward with it. Yeah. Who's going to start by declaring? I mean, I remember my good friend Bob Colimo, remember when he declared yes, his, his wealth? And Joshua Igara, yeah. they both declared. And we said, ah, 10 million a month. <laughs> ah, you know, it was, it was a big laugh. Absolutely. Nobody believed, you know, yeah. that's how Kenyans are. Mm. Prof, Jeff, you have the last word. We are in a very interesting space in the history of our country. One of the things that we must do is to urge those in the political class to de-ethnicize our politics. The bane of this country, which is potentially a good country, is that we are constantly being mobilized on the basis of ethnicity. I look forward to the day when we'll stop these meetings Luhias have met, Kisis have met, Kambas have met, Mount Kenya have met, Mijikenda have met. When will Kenya meet? I look forward to that day. And I'm urging President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, this is your administration. When history is written, it will be said of your administration that during that administration, there were certain court orders that were issued which were not obeyed. President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, remember this is your administration. President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, it will be remembered that it is during this period that your deputy president took a different trajectory. Call your deputy president to order. It will be remembered, President Uhuru Muigai Kenyatta, that you shook hands with Mzee Raila Odinga on the ninth day of March 2018 to build bridges. It will be said, by why, why are you building others and burning others? My appeal to all of us Kenyans let us not respond to the call by politicians to think ethnically. Our duty is to think about Kenya, to think about the next generation, not about the next elections. The politicians are thinking about the next elections and distributing to us monies which they took from us. Reject them, use the ballot, and let us raise our voices because a time such as this, silence is unpatriotic. Silence is betrayal. Let us all arise and do that which is good and right for the sake of children who live now and children yet to be born. And you mentioned the ninth day of March 2018, two days from now, the ninth day of October, National Day of Prayer. You mentioned that, right? Thank Three you. days of prayer, right? Yes. October 9th, 10th. And and when we pray, let us not mock God. Mm. The God that we worship must never be mocked. And the prayers which uh, the God that uh, we Christians worship has said in the book of Isaiah chapter 1. You can read it starting from verses 8 up to about 16. That there are prayers that he does not listen to. So even as President Uhuru Kenyatta calls the country to order, he must begin by calling himself to order. He must come with clean hands, and then the rest of us, he will also call to order. And I know that I should have concluded, but uh, since uh, this has come up, this is a good moment with this prayer. We have heard of uh, Brutus where he says about the tide in the affairs of men, the tide which when taken at their flow of the floods leads to fortune. The tide which when ignored, when that opportunity is missed, leads the whole voyage of the lives of men and women to be bound in shallows and in uh, disasters. That 
we must take the current when it counts. Otherwise, we lose everything. P uh, <clears throat> Prof, what was that that Malimu Nyerere said? What was that thing that Nyerere said? Akitaka sana hii kitu. Ukiona mtu anataka sana mm. kwenda ikulu. E, na wanasiasa wote utaka sana. Ukiona anataka sana <laughs> kwenda ikulu. <laughs> Jihadhari naye. Kwani kuna biashara gani Na wote huwa wanataka, wanataka hivyo sana. <laughs> biashara gani wanafanya? Alafu kuna wabwana, kuna wabwana na watwana. That's what I learned tonight. <laughs> kuna wabwana na kuna <laughs> kuna watu na viatu. <laughs> kuna watu na viatu. <laughs> Prof, thank That's you so much for being my first guest. I really appreciate yeah, it, gentlemen. Yeah. Let's and, 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 keep talking. And I think you are sartorially elegant. You are I, properly attired. Am I okay? Am I? Uh, will I do in the uh, court? I the royal see court? your your is flattened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget, JKL is powered by Visa. Is this going to work today, guys? <laughs> okay, we go. <laughs> I can't see it. It's too far. So where you shop matters. The first 100 small businesses to register for Visa payments on the Visa Small Business Hub. Get this. We'll get 20,000 shillings worth of digital advertising. That's right. Hashtag where you, where you shop matters. Merchants who register and select PesaPal will get one, a free MPOS machine to accept card payments, two, free tools and plugins to accept online payments. Register to visit at www.visa.co.ke. Again, www.visa.co.ke. Thanks so much for being a part of this show. As always, Wednesdays, it's all about those three letters on the keyboard that follow each other, J, K, L. From now on, we are live in studio. That's right. So keep tweeting at Queen Anger Jeff, at Citizen TV Kenya, the hashtag JK Live. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. And thanks so much for your conversation. Thank you. Thank we'll you. see you. Good night. Good luck. God bless you all.